being inclusive is not an easy task. One reason for that is it requires us to change our beliefs and battle behaviors that we have internalized over many years. Today's guest offers a solution, which they call inclusion nudges. Hi, welcome to the School of Becoming. My name is Ingo Raut, and together with a panel of experts, as well as with the support of Manage Magazine, we curated a program that helps you to act more inclusively on an individual, interpersonal, leadership, organizational, and cultural level. Today's guests are Tina Nielsen and Lisa Kapinski. Together, the two combined their expertise in social science and behavior science and founded an organization called Inclusion Nudges with the ambition to nudge people to become more inclusive. Engaging a community of people, they came up with a lot of practical tips that are science-backed that can help you and others to act more inclusively. They have also authored a couple of books which outline these practical tips of which they will share some of in today's session. With that, welcome Tina and Lisa. Uh, Lisa and I would like to start by just sharing with you a little bit about uh, our own story. Um, and uh, we want to give you a very um, brief introduction to the human mind um, and why the understanding of that led us to, to create this um, change and design approach that we call inclusion nudges. And then we want to give you some very specific examples. And to Ingo's point, we want to also share with you these how-to resources that we create so that you know that there is help <laughs> to uh, um, you, that you can access after uh, we've given you this brief introduction. And please, you know, keep writing um, in the chat. Um, we uh, would love to hear about challenges that you're facing because uh, we want to give that some time also to address some of those and speak to those. Um, well, so very briefly about um, uh, Lisa and I, uh, we met each other back in 2013 when we were both working internally in big multinationals. Um, and we were leading the work on inclusion and diversity and equity. Um, and I think it's uh, fair to say that at some points we felt like we were pushing water uphill. It's, it's, uh, it's a tough job. Um, and uh, luckily we have a uh, shared acquaintance, Eric, who um, picked up uh, on the fact that Lisa and I were both applying behavioral science and social science in a way where we could design uh, interventions and organizational processes and um, uh, learning journeys and eye-openers and uh, we could redesign systems um, and we could actually get many many people to move in the same direction at the same time but without um, having to push and pull or convince them that this was important to do so he said I think the two of you need to talk. I think the two of you need to connect because I think there could be some matching in that. And uh, we're, we're really grateful for Eric uh, seeing this and introducing us uh, to each other. Yeah, so Eric is now um, head of diversity inclusion, um, working on the team in charter communications in the US. But previous to that, he was doing a lot of work around inclusion and diversity and corporate social responsibility. Um, and, and the funny thing around that was serendipity and how a network can grow, just like we're so pleased to know all of you that are here and, and how our network expands. We, neither one of us knew Eric very well. <laughs> he came to us in our networks through another person bringing in. So that serendipity and the value of interaction um, with people and the spontaneity around how do we connect people up is really powerful. And Tina, what do we do? We scheduled a Skype call like seven, eight years ago, was it? Yeah. And yeah. yeah, and um, boy, did we have a lot to share. <laughs> and that's what brought us to this point. We were sharing our experiences, just like you all are actively, thank you for actively typing in the chat section about challenges. Mm -hmm. Tina and I did that when we were talking also mm -hmm. um, around our challenges as internal change makers in the organizations we're at and in our history of working for so many decades in this area. And we were sharing about what works in our space in terms of our interests around behavioral economics, our social psychology background, our anthropology background, linguistics background, um, and, and how do we take that insight and knowledge around human behavior and behavioral change and organizational systemic change design work that needs to happen and the stuck patterns or the challenges like you're writing down the chat section, 
how do we overcome those challenges? Yeah, so based on the fact that we started um, sharing with each other how we could actually nudge people to change behavior, um, we realized that we could also empower other people in our network to be able to do this without having to be um, behavioral or social scientist experts. Um, because so many in our network who were working with this kind of work were struggling. And um, we also saw a global pattern that people would leave their position after two to three years, or a lot of them would burn out. So we started actually uh, writing up these examples in a very detailed way so others could do it. And then we, um, it, it became what we call how-to examples. And it was all about enabling and empowering each other. And we invited people to share examples that they um, uh, saw working, uh, but not just any kind of example. It was examples of practical things they did that could influence the unconscious mind. And we will get back to why it's important that it's influencing the unconscious mind and not just a best practice, um, because this is a, a change methodology that supplements a lot of other things that can, that are valuable to do in this line of work. And um, to that point, I uh, see Jan typed in a question is uh, relevant to talk here. These practical examples we had to share are not just within the corporate workplace where we were coming from mm -hmm. at that moment, um, Jan was asking, he's working in the space of democratic participation. Yep. Um, so these apply in any setting and scenario. And in the new version of the guidebook, we really expanded out the scope that it could be schools, it could be within government agencies, it could be with yep. NGOs, et cetera. So while you may hear us speaking sometimes on the workplace setting, uh, the concepts and the designs and the approaches also have been applied in many other settings. So you can definitely please take them and see other places where you can adapt them to your context. Yeah, what well, one of, actually the first example I shared with Lisa back in 2013 was in a corporate setting that I designed that, but it has later been used inside refugee camps. It's been used in city participation, participation uh, co-creation processes. It's been used for city development. It's been used for, addressing issues uh, of, of mergers or, you know, crisis situations. So this exact same behavioral design can be used in many different contexts and settings. That's how we've written up these guidebooks that um, we will also share with you uh, later on. Um, yeah. So what Tina and I picked up in that early conversation in 2013, um, and, we, and we were sharing what works and we were hearing the demand across the network, give us more. We really want to understand the approach, the science behind it. Um, the methodology, the, be inspired by the examples. Um, what we did is we spent some, quite some time going deep into research, our own context, and it was always, we knew it had to be a pragmatic solution uh, based on science, but practical application and, and put into action and proven and tested by change makers like all of us here. And so we coined the term inclusion nudges, um, we developed the methodology and we started sharing and initially it was that sharing document, document in 2013 and that's where we kept hearing from people in our network give us more and that's what led to the first edition of the guidebook, then the next edition of the guidebook. And wow, it was been some time, but we spent a lot of time writing up the new edition of the guidebook. Um, so this gives more than 100 examples, it was released in April of this year. And everything is scripted out how to for you. We also in the last, let's celebrate in the last uh, two weeks, Tina, it's been release the action guide series. And in that it's, it's a, a shorter version. And um, those are 30 examples of inclusion nudges within particular framing audiences or readership. One is for leaders, one is for talent selection and the other action guide book is for motivating allies. And those are shorter, straight to the action guidebooks for sharing across organizations. Whereas the full guidebook is if you're a change maker, that is your deep resource book that you go to. And it's not a book that you would necessarily read A to Z, but you'll open it up and, and deal with particular challenges like you're typing here in your chat and find inspiration for designs that are based on behavioral science um, that have worked within a particular context and as Tina gave her example, can be applied to others. So sometimes we may be inspired by an example that comes from a school setting that could be used in, in a, a government ministry um, or in a workplace. Mm -hmm. So that's been our journey and we have many ways we're sharing it, including like the conversations we're having today.
So just a little bit about the background uh, behind this and why um, inclusive interactions are so important. Lisa, do you want to speak to this? Yeah, so, oh, okay, in the time with the pandemic, certainly we have a lot of heightened focus on um, and, and appreciation towards the healthcare um, sector and healthcare professionals across all different spaces. As much as we would hope that this is um, a sector that is rising up and we see in so many places rising up to meet the challenges that we have on healthcare, when it comes to inclusive interaction, studies show that you know, they're susceptible to all the patterns that we see across human beings also within their sector. And as much as we may hope that people will speak up and voice dissent, and I see this in the chat too, that several people are writing that the challenges are self-silencing, yeah. um, you're writing, or people are writing the challenges, how do I um, deal with the hierarchy? Well, there's a definite hierarchy within the medical profession. And what you see is results, junior doctors, or students not speaking up, nurses not speaking up, um, medical errors coming up because of poor communication or, or holding back and self-silencing. And even the UN World Health Organization has called out that one in 10 um, uh, illnesses are related to poor patient care within a hospital in mm -hmm. countries that are high income countries. And they're starting to call out now in the World Health Organization that um, illnesses or injuries or disabilities resulting from poor health care are now rising up in the top 10 um, illnesses globally. This mm -hmm. is a really serious space. And so the consequences, while we may be thinking about, oh, it's just talking, <laughs> mm -hmm. has dramatic life and death results on people in this example that we're giving here on why inclusive interactions matter. And the next uh, context we have is the workplace piece. Mm -hmm. And we see similar patterns playing out with employees around the decision, uh, do I speak or not speak? Will I be heard or not heard? Will my ideas be valued or not valued? Is it worth speaking up anymore? You, you get beaten down after a while. Mm -hmm. Should I be speaking up or not? Mm -hmm. um, and we all experience these dynamics in, in our own way, based on our lived experiences, based on our positions within the organization, and um, certainly the leader as well and the manager. So we have a consequence around how can innovation and growth happen? How can engagement and living up to our fullest potential happen if we can't get our ideas out, if we aren't feeling connected with our cohorts, and um, if our leaders are not receptive to hearing these ideas. Mm -hmm. So these are big challenges to organizations and certainly in today's time, what we're seeing with economic um, impact from the pandemic and many other dynamics happening within countries around the world. This is a space that definitely, we would think most organizations want to have an optimized workforce and an optimized group of leaders and managers who are inclusive. Yeah, so inclusive interactions are also important in terms of, of engaging citizens and, and society. Uh, and that might also speak to some of the, the comments in the chat. Um, well, so we've all witnessed the Black Lives Matters movement and, and these demonstrations picking up. There's also been a lot of, of gender equality in these global movements really spreading. Um, and um, we also see more and more research and studies come out showing that there is systemic discrimination bias going on regardless of what some politicians choose to, to communicate. Um, and we also um, see a pessimism um, showing up across a lot of countries that there's not a whole lot of people believing that we will have a general reduction in inequalities. Um, and I, I think what's really um, struck me for many years, um, I, I'm, I'm a part of the World Economic Forum um, Young Global Leaders Community, um, is really these uh, global risk reports that has, that has really highlighted over the years that more and more people feel disempowered. But the problem is that Technology also gives them a feeling of empowerment that they have a voice and they can air their voice on social media. They can mobilize movements across, um, you know, big, many diverse groups in society. But at the same time, they feel extremely disempowered because they don't feel 
that they're actually being invited, even though they are invited to speak up, but that the, the decision makers are not using their input. And we also see this increased polarization in societies. And we see that people have a, a extreme need for belonging and we have an extreme need for significance. And that has a strong correlation with people seeking out groups where they feel respected. And almost regardless of what they are respected for, if there is a commonality, something they can meet around, something they can have significance. And, and there's so much proof now that this also leads to some kind of radicalization. And not just talking about Islamic radicalization, but a radicalization in terms of denying evidence about, for example, the current health crisis we're in, or denying evidence about whatever it might be, or meeting up around something that's not for the greater good of all of us. So, so there's so much going on that, you know, we need to find ways to li listen to each other's diverse perspectives and use that, leverage that. Um, and so, so the need is just growing. So it would say being inclusive of each other's um, different perspectives and being inclusive of a variety of insights and know-how and use it to make better solutions and make sustainable development and make good decisions and grow our communities and our organization in a healthy way where we can thrive as human beings is always important. But the situation we're in now with an extreme change and uncertainty and, and crisis, I mean, we need this more than ever. And and, you know, we have 40 years of research showing that, you know, all this evidence showing how much we can gain from this. So it's not because we don't know how important this is. It's not because politicians and leaders and every one of us haven't heard about that this improves collaboration and critical thinking and better innovation and, you know, well-being and creativity. We know this. But the problem is really how the human mind has evolved or not evolved. Maybe we should say that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so maybe, Lisa, you want to speak to these two brain systems. And that's actually the foundation for the inclusion nudges um, change approach is to understand this dynamic between the different uh, thinking modes in our mind and, and, and leverage on that. So I'm sure many of you may be familiar with this um, dynamic. And if you've read Daniel Kahneman's Fast, um, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. Um, so system one refers to the, the, the earliest part of the brain. And um, this is where the vast majority of your thinking happens, but it happens in the sense of thinking without thinking, without a, a consciousness around it that we're not aware. It's automatic. It's ensured our survival as a species. Um, it enables us to, to, to do all the things that we're doing simultaneously in the millions and bits of information that are coming in, that thankfully we don't have to be deliberative and slow. The slow thinking is system two. And that's when we're learning a new system or sometimes like when I experience and I'm typing and I'm going between different keyboards in different countries. Uh, and it's like, oh my gosh, where are the letters? I thought I knew how to type automatically. Um, that's an example of the effort that you have to put in into um, thinking, and that engages the system two part of the brain, the slow brain. Um, and we have these two interconnected um, cognitive systems in terms of our processing, but we're most heavily reliant upon system one. And that's where the vast majority of our processing is happening relative to system two. So when it comes to talking about behavioral change, it is within this larger system one part of our cognitive system that we need to work and design for. Mm -hmm. Typically we're speaking to system two, we're speaking with data, we're speaking as if um, pulling upon intention and willpower. So all that research uh, that Tina cited previously with you know, decades, 40 decades um, of work around DNI that's been going on, if that were sufficient to make us more inclusive in our interactions, we would have achieved it a long time ago. And that's yeah. the reason that the research, while very insightful and, and important as is data, is not sufficient for behavioral change. And yeah. Tina, you want to give the illustration to show that? 
Yeah, I just want to show um, how big a difference the unconscious mind and, and, and the conscious mind have in, in how we perceive the world or issues or see things or understand things. Um, so if some of you might also be familiar with this, but those of you who are not, um, if you look at square A and square B, um, you look for which, which gray shade is the darkest, A or B. And the majority of people in this illustration sees A as the darkest, but if I then change the frame, now you see something different. Now you actually see that the two squares are the same exact color, A and B are identical. So now you know this, right? With your conscious mind, system two. Okay, I get it, I see it. All right, she convinced me. And then I move the frame and then all of a sudden you can't see it anymore. Now you see that A is the darkest, even though you know with your rational conscious mind system two, that's not the case. I know they're identical, but I can't see it. And that's because your system one, uh, as Lisa showed, you know, is 99% of everything you see, you see through the unconscious mind. And that jumps to conclusion through mental shortcuts in a split second, 200 milliseconds. And it does so by spotting patterns. And in this particular illustration, it sees two patterns, the checkboard pattern, and also that B is in a row of, of light squares, light gray shades. So as soon as we spot a pattern, our unconscious mind system one jumps to conclusion that this is reality. This is the exact same thing that happens when we're hiring people. The mind will go look for patterns. It will perceive the candidate uh, who looks most like ourselves or the other people who were previously in that position will perceive that candidate as the most qualified candidate. When people suggest new ideas for things that we should change, our unconscious mind will look for patterns. It will look for something that reminds them of a previous idea that was a success. And then that in their mind becomes that's the best idea. It might not be the best idea and most often it's not. But that's how strong that system is. So even though we know the unconscious mind will still control our behavior. So that's what we need to, to, to stop. We need to close this gap that, that's between these two systems. And this means you can know something, but do the exact opposite. You can have a certain set of values, but do the opposite of those values. You can have an intention of doing this. I want to hire the best qualified person, or I actually want to listen to the perspective of the citizens, but your unconscious mind is doing something else. Um, it's looking for patterns, it's making yourself feel comfortable, it's making you um, come across to yourself as I'm the good person, or I, I, uh, I'm really open to new perspectives and great ideas. I'm a professional leader or I'm a great politician, uh, but, but your, your behavior might do something different. Um, so so that's, that's the problem. The problem is the situation we're in right now with a lot of changes and crisis, it actually, um, yeah, unfortunately, it actually makes these mental shortcuts even stronger. The biases, the stereotypes, the uh, we look for familiarity. We want to be with people similar to others. Um, we have a mental overload. Uh, we rely on default behaviors. Uh, we have this tribe of mentality of, of a preference for, for our in-group, people who are similar to ourselves. Um, we are emotional, we are, we are, we're afraid, um, our memory decreases, our self-control decreases. So we can't rely on the, un uh, on the conscious slow mind and, and rational mind to do all this work because it's really just going to paralyze us. Um, I'm going to skip this one and move, move to this. The good thing in crisis and in change uh, situations as we're in right now is that we also see so much potential we can leverage um, because all of a sudden we see things in a new perspective. Um, uh, we start searching for new opportunities because we realize this is not gonna go away fast. Um, it sparks creativity because we're forced to it or before, because people start you know, communicating in a different way. Um, we interact in new ways, we work in new ways, and all of that is pushing us to see new things that we didn't see as options before. That's really what we, what we want to leverage to actually close uh, this gap. Good point, Lorna. Uh, Lorna or Lauren, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, your name. 
um, you had written about into how do we realize good intentions? Well, that's exactly this yeah. slide. <laughs> um, and you're spot on for calling that out because most of us, I think almost everyone I've ever connected with has good intentions to be a fair, yeah. respectful, inclusive person. Um, so that comes into our, our sense of the intentions our, our hope in the system too, but the actual driver of the behavior is our system one. And in times of that stress, you go even further into that reliant on that system one. Mm -hmm. So um, we feel your pain as you wrote that in there. How do we realize the good intentions? And, and that's the practical examples that we're gonna be offering up in just a moment that are very centered around, we need to activate realization or seeing the gaps feeling that tension around that gap um, in a way that motivates for commitment and buy-in and then actually taking action. We've yeah. all heard about the gap between the words and actually doing or the action. And we really wanna focus on the doing piece and to mm -hmm. do it, it needs to um, not be effortful. It has to be easy to do. And so that's where having examples of inclusion nudges in the guidebook can spark where to start on addressing closing the gap. Let's um, head into the um, examples. So yes. inclusion nudges are um, based on nudge theory and behavioral economics and, and human motivation, psychology, social group dynamics, um, so many factors that we brought into this. And this is, these are based on um, sciences and the barriers, a lot, a lot like you were writing in the chat around inclusivity. And it is a gentle push uh, for our system one thinking. Um, and, and sometimes system two, uh, to help to become more inclusive. So we're closing that gap between the intentions and the actual doing, or mm -hmm. the intentions and our processes and systems within organizations, which we design ourselves. Yes. So it's what we do as well as the systems that we have designed and we've implemented. So, so we, we chose just a snapshot of, of a few examples um, out of 100 examples. We've chosen, I think, five or six to share with yeah. you today. So you know, keep in mind there is, there is help to get and, and much more designs and, and more complicated designs. We're giving you something that's actually easy to go and try out immediately uh, right after this, this session. The examples we're giving you now are different ways to create more inclusive interactions and also reduce um, these mental shortcuts and, and and biases where we jump to conclusion uh, really fast and in that way exclude ideas or information or people without even having an intention to do so. I um, wanted to start with sharing with you a very simple way, something you can do when you're in the moment, when you're talking to people or you're listening to them share something with you, or maybe they're giving a presentation. Um, you invited in uh, citizens and, and your mind already kind of made up its mind of what the solution is, but you need to, to listen differently to people. So in the moment as you're listening or, or, or in, in interaction with people, you can ask yourself inside your head in silence, ask yourself flip questions. Um, flip questions are when you're helping your mind see or listen in a different perspective and change your behavior in the moment. And just to give you an example, this is a flip question. If she was the CEO and not the intern, would I find her idea more relevant? Would I ask other questions? Or if he was an extrovert like myself and not an introvert, would I ask him for more input? Or if she was a he, would I interpret what she just did differently? Um, or if he was you know, whatever, you know, would I ask more critical questions right now? Um, you know, there, there are so many of these um, biases and stereotypes that are controlling how we listen and how we perceive what people share with us and how our unconscious mind process what people share with us. And so to avoid that your mind jumps to conclusion too fast, you can ask these questions. And what happens is 
you 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 flip the perspective and all of a sudden you will start over time experiencing that your micro behaviors change you know it can be little things like you might not even have noticed it before but it can be little things like we tend to say sounds when we're listening you know uh -huh, mm, uh -huh, mm, okay or we ask questions if we're engaged but if we're not if we already excluded that idea or information we might just kind of lean back and have a more neutral facial expression. And, you know, that actually influenced what people are sharing with us and how we're communicating and interacting with them. Um, you know, it's, and it, it's not like, you know, your biases or aware of your biases. There, there is actually also a global trend that, about unconscious bias awareness. If you train that, if you know that, then you can change it. But you can't because knowing is in system two and doing is in system one. And you can't control it with willpower or consciousness because it's going to give you a mental overload. And as you're listening to people, there's no way you can have this going. Um, we do know when you start asking these flip questions, it's a conscious decision to start asking them inside your head as you're listening. But over time, it's going to become a new habit for you. So it's like, for, take Lisa and I, for example, we've been in this line of work for 20 years, <laughs> Lisa, even longer, right? We have just as many biases and mental shortcuts and, you know, jump to conclusion and influenced by stereotypes as everybody else. So we keep asking these questions to ourselves in our collaboration, um, you know, and, and, and it actually makes a difference that we ask them because it's not going to, the biases are not going away. I had one earlier <laughs> today, Tina, that I was like huh? in this world of working online and, and the person yeah. didn't put their camera on because yeah. of Wi-Fi bandwidth. And I was like, huh, if he had his camera on, would I have felt more closer to his idea he put forth? I mean, I, it's, it's, you start playing with this all the time yeah. and, and it's something, um, that does get down to the idea of, of nudge theory. Um, yeah. So the power of what looks like something very small has a tremendous impact overall. If you think about how this can redirect and close that gap. So yeah. um, we encourage you to, and starting small is a good way to start a habit. I heard Ingo, you were talking about, there's something about habits that you had previously are coming up. The power of small is a way of making a larger piece bigger going forward. Yeah. Yeah. And ask this to your coworkers as well. Ask these questions because instead of blaming each other for being biased, um, be curious, ask these questions and, and you'll see that people lean in and become curious and exploring more of this Wait, Wow. Yeah. If that consultant wasn't for McKinsey, we wouldn't just blindly sit here and swallow it all up. If, if it was, you know, somebody else we didn't know, we would be more critical or something like, you know, uh, again, it also, you know, since it's going on, you're asking these questions inside your head. You can also ask a little bit of in political correct, correct questions sometimes. Like, if he didn't look so dirty or if he wasn't homeless, would I actually believe more in what he said? Or like, really trigger yourself, provoke yourself to hold up, hold up that mirror. And then, then uh, you, you'll actually be able to push yourself uh, to in another direction. Okay, so imagine, right, we're sitting in a group of, we, we have a group of people gathered and we really want to make sure we leverage, uh, you know, all the know-how and expertise and knowledge and perspectives and input in that group. The problem is there's a lot of group dynamics going on. There's a lot of self-silencing. A simple trick is get people to write down their thoughts before you start talking. So you totally avoid that people are influenced by each other's perspective and that nobody's self-silencing, but everybody is writing down their, uh, you know, you can frame it up whenever, however you want, like write your critical inner voice right now about the decision we're about to make or write an argument for or against or um, write down what you think is the most important in terms of this issue we're about to discuss or, you know, you ask them, you frame it up how you want, but ask them to write anonymously on a piece of paper before they start talking. And this is actually really proven to significantly reduce that kind of group think and, and self-silencing and it has a massive impact. If you work in a group where it's not possible for people to be writing anything down, or if you know that people are dyslexic or, or can't write or they're shy of you know other people seeing their handwriting, you can use another version where people share, just like two people standing next to each other. They share their perspective with each other and, and, and they present each other's, you know, uh, input for the, in, in the plenary again. So they, you create this psychological safety in the group. So there are many different ways you could do this, but this actually has 
uh, a very um, high impact on the, on the group in terms of more inclusive interactions. And it's very easy to do online also. Yeah. And there are many tools that are out there. Yeah. One that we'll shout out here is um, usecandor.org um, by a professor at Wharton Business School. Um, and, and that's entirely free yeah. online tool um, and something worth to play around with, but also internally in your organization, there are many ways you could design your own processes to do that. Yeah, and might also just want to speak to once you then have a pile of notes with all these perspectives on, ask the group to take turns in randomly picking a note and you know build on that idea. Again, you don't you don't need to know whose idea it is or whose input it is, but again, make it inclusive. The interaction is designed to be inclusive in this way. You get access to the diversity and you you use it, you you leverage it in the group. So again, design the facilitation of the group to be um, inclusive. By default. And this is something oftentimes Tina and I experience whenever we're asking, okay, so what is the challenge? And the challenge is sometimes ideas get too closely associated with people. And we go back, so what's your intention? Your mm -hmm. intention is to get access to all the diversity in the group, all ideas, better decision making. I saw several of you were writing in the chat your struggle with around how to get decisions made or, yeah. or self silencing. Um, all of these dynamics can be adapted within this technique here, which again looks like a simple technique but has a powerful impact back. And our intention yes. outcome piece is to have better decision making, which many of you were calling out as your challenges, yeah. um, how to um, spark up new ideas. Um, mm -hmm. So the yeah. techniques can lead to that. Yeah. Yep. And you, you could say that speaks to the, the next example we chose to bring uh, to the table today, which are um, physical prompters to interrupt bias. This does require a little bit of pre-knowledge about biases and stereotypes and, and how all of this is sneaking into decision-making or collaboration or interaction. I see uh, nodding her head a lot there. So you must have experiences around this one. Do you want yeah. to unmute yourself for a second? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Tina. Yeah. This is amazing. Yes, absolutely. And they're yeah. very subtle. Um, I'm also a, not all, I'm into gender equality, but also into diversity and inclusion. So yeah, that plays a huge role and people not, you know, they're there, but then how do they're listening to what we're saying about gender equality. And I know for, for a fact that they're completely against it because of a, yeah, of what we know, what happens behind the closed doors. So yeah. 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 yeah, thanks, Sally. I mean, on the gender equality piece, so the original design, some of you may have seen in the a second edition of the guidebook was centered around gender and this one, and it was addressing the issue that women are interrupted 2.7 times more than men. Yeah, look at you going, Sally. <laughs> recognize that pattern and so the design piece was how to interrupt that inter so how to interrupt the interrupter and the technique that we use there that we were inspired by um you know one of you one of our, our community peers um axel and what he did is they were knocking on the table and then they evolved to hotel bells were around the meeting table and anytime they were twofold, uh, when bias would creep in, they would call it out by making an auditory cue. This is in the days of sitting around a table, but he also played with that around when interruptions were happening mm -hmm. as a way to surface the pattern of the dynamic. So this is a really important point. We are not out to blame and shame people. Boy, that is completely ineffective <laughs> at making change happen. Um, some of you are writing about psychological safety and blame the person culture is not a psychologically safe culture. Mm -hmm. um, but if we say, this is again, back to the point, what are our intended outcomes that we wanna have happen? If it's better decision making, if it's all voices being heard, um, surface new thinking, well, then we want to stop those patterns that are unconscious and limiting that from happening. And so when we can focus on the techniques to um, interrupt bias at play or to interrupt the interruption uh, based on social roles, stereotypes, uh, uh, implicit associations that we may have about people, then we have designs to stop that from happening. Mm -hmm. And it could be as little as having a physical prompter, a card you can throw on the table, like colored post-it note, stick it on, make it visible that here is something going on that's not okay and that might be interfering with this, but you don't necessarily have to be able to say, well, that's the so-and-so bias or, you know, but just 
you know, get everybody in the group alert so there's something going on. So use physical prompters of some kind. Yeah. So we have about 10 minutes left and I think we have about three yep. more to share, Tina, and then definitely yep. we want to loop back in, but I'm yeah. trying to bring your comments in also as we go to it. Yeah. Yeah, this is really powerful and that is just simply show your openness to, to dissenting views. And that was a theme also we saw in the comments. Um, how can we um, help to divert the kind of conf uh, confirmation bias and overconfidence bias that we may have? in terms of um, you know, potentially going down the wrong path <laughs> or operating with not a full set of the data or missing a complete aspect of the organizational culture or employee inputs or citizens' perspectives or dynamics that are happening. Simply by saying and also writing, this task requires critical thinking first opens the stage to have critical thinking. It also signifies that this is a um, goal for us, an intention to have, and there's less, less self-silencing. Um, this also is really powerful whenever um, you can use extra techniques on how you surface or share the critical thinking. So you could go back to the right before speaking, you could go to designs that we have called out with share with a peer, um, there are many ways, but make the opening that you're allowing contentious decisions coming in. So there was a theme in the conversation about argument and entrenchment that can happen. Polarization can happen. Um, and those are granting contrary to our intentions. So this design helps to tackle that. Mm -hmm. And the, the design here, the behavioral design here is that you're priming the unconscious mind to behave in a particular way, which is to lean in, be curious, make constructive dialogue about, you know, um, not agreeing on things, but that's okay. Whereas if you start out by saying, hey, let's make sure we make an efficient meeting and we all get along and, you know, everybody has a voice, it has a completely different impact. It is literally by saying this task requires critical thinking. That's when you're priming the unconscious mind to be more inclusive in that kind of interaction. Um, also, um, imagine that you're doing... Um, well, you don't even have to imagine when we are doing virtual collaboration, online meetings, um, you know, we all, we all experience this, that there's, you know, certain people in the group talking a lot and, and some are not. So try to keep track of, of who's in the meeting and then keep systematic track by using a checklist to balance who's speaking and who's not speaking. Because in any group, there's always an in-group and an out-group. We have a uh, there are certain people we, you know, have similarities with. There are people we recognize the communication style better. Um, you know, it's, you know, and, and that means that in-group and out-group opportunities are not equal. And so in that kind of interaction in such a, a, a meeting, it can be difficult to make sure it's inclusive. But if you have a checklist where you have the names of everybody um, who's participating, you can literally check off, you know, have everybody spoken up? Have you asked them questions? You can do the same when you delegate tasks, you know, make sure you kind of track over time who's getting what opportunities in terms of what assignments are they, you know, are you allocating to them? Um, you know, and, and you can use this kind of uh, checklist in, in any kind of work. You don't have to be a leader or a project manager to, to, to have such a checklist or the meeting facilitator you can have this um, yourself. So again, play around with checklists because it's a great design for making sure that you are, um, you see the patterns really, spot the patterns. Like we just showed you with the um, A and B square, when you frame it up differently, you start seeing and noticing a different pattern. Um, so, you know, be aware that there are uh, another 95 examples for you in, of these behavioral designs. Um, what's the commonality across all these examples that we're sharing with you here and that are in the action guides and, and the guidebook is that they're science-based. So we can explain every example with science. Why does it work? They are effective. We're not relying on the con conscious mind to do it. They make it easy for people to be inclusive. You don't have to convince them. It's not about them understanding all this complexity. Just make it easy for them to do it. They are automatically reducing biases. They're closing the gap between the two brain systems. It, can, it gives people the freedom to be who they are. 
And uh, you're not threatening them to behave in a specific way. You're not punishing them for not. Uh, they have a freedom of choice. Um, that's the power of nudging. Um, you make it actionable um, and also doable. There was a very low cost to a lot of these design tweaks or redesigns. Um, and also it, it, uh, it creates positive change, uh, not just for the individual, for the group, but also for the greater good of, of all of us. Uh, and we, we just, we, we can't afford to wait for, you know, seven point, you know, whatever, two billion people worldwide to think this is a good idea. We really need to be able to, to help people uh, move in that direction faster and make sure it sticks. So that's the, the essence of, of, of this. And here's, um, Inga, you asked the pictures of the book. Here they are. <laughs> They're also on the shelves beside Tina and I. So. <laughs> Um, so, and there were some questions here. Um, we encourage you to go to the website, which you can see here. Uh, we've launched a blog now and you can see several articles there that you can read. Um, we have other resources that are there, articles, videos, and um, these are the books that are here. And someone asked, where can you purchase? And it's through Amazon. And also just to make clear that the book sale proceeds all go back to support the nonprofit inclusion nudges initiative. And then earlier I was yeah. typing about how the global initiative works. It's based on sharing and reciprocity. So we and people just like yourselves here around the world have been applying these designs now for years. And we are so pleased when we get messages as we did from Monica from the World Bank. It came in yesterday and was saying, oh, I've got the new book in my hands and I can't wait. I'm trying this one. Um, so the key is, uh, please take these, experiment, adapt to your context, and then let us know how did it go, what worked, what didn't go work, what was working within your context. You will inspire other people and we'll go forward and be um, writing these up in the blog articles or future publications. You're an important part of this movement to change how we can be more inclusive and how we connect in places that we work, in places that we live, in our communities, and our governments. This is a really important and profound approach on how we can be more effective as change makers. Lisa, Tina, I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for sharing those nudges, the science behind it and why they work. I think it's very important work that you're doing. And I got a question here in the chat asking, uh, what's next for you guys? I mean, you did all this amazing work. So where are you taking this? Well, we'll come back to you, right? On the yes. 13th of October? Someone was asking that too. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, what's next for us is that what we are trying to do is create a global movement to, to, to really fundamentally change how we achieve um, inclusion, diversity, equity faster and, and make sure it sticks um, so we don't revert back to old habits. Um, we and, and, and creating a global movement for us is really about uh, you know, what if we could actually empower and enable 7.2 billion people worldwide to actually be able to make these kind of changes with such subtle little changes with such big impact in their own community and their organizations, because we all have power within a sphere, sphere of influence. What if we could make some of these changes? Um, and hey, without, guess me, what? without meeting resistance, but just that so people would lean in and be allies with us and, and make the changes happen. And we make the changes to. happen without feeling like we're pushing that water up the hill or someone was yeah. earlier writing, which I paraphrase, um, you get shot as a messenger. You know, you carry that heavy burden about delivering the, the information about bias or patterns in the organization. Yeah. Inclusion nudges help to minimize that dynamic and help surface the focus on yeah. the ideas yeah. that we're trying to get forth or the patterns yeah. or the data. Yeah. So, you know, everybody who's participating in this uh, session today, you know, uh, help us figure out what the next step should be to empower more people, because I, I'm not sure Lisa and I know as a, am I, we wrote these examples up. We need to get them out there in the world. So by all means, if you have ideas how to do that, help us out, spread the word, spread the, these enablers these practical designs help us get it out there, empower more people and let us know if you have ideas for how, how this could have more impact. What do you think of the session? If you want, provide us with feedback in the comments below. That's it. I hope you found this class insightful as well as practical. If you want to attend one of our future classes, engage with the speakers and discuss with others on the topics 
like activating inclusion, head over to schoolofbecoming.org 